Good, uh, good morning, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here and to deliver this talk. And um, the talk uh, is about the W mass determination at Hadron Colliders, and um, uh, decided to split it into two parts. Uh, one about some recent theoretical developments, and another part about a recent paper that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago about the combination of the experimental results uh, from uh, Hadron Collider and from, from LAP as well. And um, so th that's why I'm asking if you can. Uh, and uh, the, the two uh, topics are at any rate related and uh, can be described as the discussion of QCD uncertainties in, this, in the determination of this uh, parameter, because also in the experimental work, there is uh, the problem of handling how QCD is uh, described uh, by the different experiments in their analysis. So that's the, the reason. So uh, the outline of the talk, is a modeling of QCD effects and the problem of estimating the associated uncertainties, then proposal for a new of a new observables to better to better describe. No? So the proposal of a new observable and eventually uh, the, the experimental part with the issue and the combination of different experimental results. Here you have a summary of all the results available so far, including experimental values and uh, the electric fit here. Now, um, this is quite well known, so we'll be fast on that. Uh, the um, W mass is uh, determined from the analysis of charge current Rayleigh distributions, kinematical distributions, but not invariant mass which is not available, we have to rely on uh, observables defined in the transverse plane. And thanks to a Jacobian factor, th there are observables like the lepton transverse momentum distribution or the lepton pair transverse mass who have a Jacobian enhancement, which brings sensitivity from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two level, which is still um, make, make it affordable, the discussion of the, no, okay. Uh, the, the problem that we want to discuss is uh, how the MW is determined from these uh, kinematical distributions. And uh, the point of the idea is that uh, for one given kinematical distribution, for instance, the lepton transverse momentum, we compute uh, this distribution for several hypotheses of the W boson mass. For each of them, we perform a chi-square fit uh, in the region around the Jacobian peak where there is the maximum sensitivity. And then we look for the minimum of this chi-square distribution. And MW, with experimental MW, is the value associated to, to the position of the minimum of this chi-square distribution. Now, the point is that we want to make a measurement at the level of 10 to the minus four, ideally 10 MeV, let's say eight MeV would be 10 to the minus four. And the point is, the challenge is that the templates have to be very precise in order to avoid the introduction of a theoretical bias. Any uncertainty in the computation of, of the templates contributes to the theoretical systematic error on MW. And in order to appreciate the differences in MW at the order of 20 MeV, we will need to appreciate the distortions in templates at the level of one per mil. And uh, of course, if we want to go lower, <laughs> the numbers become even smaller, so very challenging. Now, the question that I want to address is how are QCD scale variations handled in the template preparations? Because in practice, each time we choose one set of scales, we are defining our model and each, so and different scale choices are different equivalent models. But of course, uh, then the distributions will be distorted accordingly. And this becomes a systematic, theoretical systematic error. Sure, please. Oh, you <laughs> Okay, so okay, so 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 no no <laughs> so you withdraw the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't have a question anymore. No. But uh, so my understanding is you're fitting the mass but not the width. No, okay, so uh 
This will come later. Or? Uh, it can come later. The, the idea is that um, okay, it's a long answer, <laughs> in the sense that um, from the theoretical point of view, you have to compute the width, and then you would have a formula for the width, and uh, the formula depends on MW. And in this way, when you yeah. change MW, you would automatically you live, also change the expression of the width. If this you would, live the, in the standard model, right? I mean. In the model you're using to fit, okay, mm -hmm. okay whatever okay. you're using, mm -hmm. this would be the rigorous way to go. Well, what is done is instead to use the experimental width in the preparation of these templates. This is another way to go, uh, which is not as rigorous as the first one. Now the impact in uh, in this uh, analysis by if you change the, the W width by hand, let's say, uh, you will induce a shift on MW at the order of the, of the order of one MeV or so in the standard model I'm discussing. So I would say that at the moment, this is not the top priority in the discussion, but you're absolutely right that a consistent fit of the standard model would require a perfect theoretical formula, including an, a theoretical expression for gamma W. Yeah, and okay, and the width you are using now is it fixed in the fit? It's the world average at the moment, so oh, yeah, from it's... the PDG world average. Uh huh. Okay, I think it would be good to, you know, let it float. My my input. I mean, not even use the theoretical formula, but uh, maybe even use it as a fit. It's... But if you use, if you let it float, then yeah. the width is sensitive. So sensitivity to the width is in a different tail of the distributions so that the two effects don't factorize, but are not so strongly correlated as one would expect. But of course, as, again, if you float it, of course, you will have some correlation. Yeah. I mean, it's not that strong. We tried to play this game, uh, estimating the parametric impact of gamma w on the mw determination and it, it is at the one mv level one so MV. it's a it's, it's a smaller uh, yeah. effect uh, compared mm -hmm. to uh, the problems that we're discussing here okay now i'll take for now uh, it's this is an important and rigorous question so what i just wanted to say is that templates i mentioned per mil um, if i play uh, in computing QCD, I will obtain, in the best case, uncertainty bands for these distributions, like the lepton PT, which are factor 10 larger than per mil. We are at the level of uh, plus 1, 2% for the, these distributions, which is far too large. And uh, this essentially leads to the uh, decision to follow a data-driven approach. This is what our experimental colleagues do. And uh, Monte Carlo event generators are tuned to the data, PTZ, which is measured very precisely. And uh, I want to stress for one QCD scale choice. So this is uh, still a limitation in this approach. And then once the parameters, the QCD, the true QCD <laughs> parameters are uh, fit from the data from PTZ, they're used to prepare charge current brilliant templates. This is the kind of quality of the templates. You can find them in the Atlas or in the CDF paper. And of course, the question is uh, if there are limitations in the transfer of information from neutral current to charge current, because we are learning QCD, quote unquote, from neutral current, but it's not clear whether uh, this is, applies perfectly well uh, in the charge current case. One comment is that learning uh, tuning on the data using event generators, uh, which have typically NLO plus NLL QCD perturbative accuracy can be too rough. Maybe it would be desirable in the future to start from a better starting point and QBLO plus NQBLL, for instance, in order to reduce the amount of non-perturbative physics you need to encode in this uh, non-perturbative uh, uh, tuning. The tuning also should be associated with QCD scale variations because we can, by construction, always reproduce PTZ, but we don't know if the reweighting functions that bring us on top of the data are the same if we choose different scale choice, QCD scales. And one should check and propagate how the different alternatives behave when we consider charge current Relian. Another point which should be addressed is that uh, the tuning works for sure very well when you move from PTZ to PTW. It's the same kind of uh, kinematical distribution uh, with small differences, but it's not obvious, for instance, if the lepton transverse momentum is described that well 
uh, like PTW. And then uh, there are, of course, elements of non-universality, and there is a problem of mm, ask, questioning whether uh, a data-driven approach is going to probe the standard model Lagrangian parameter. These are questions. Now, mm, another quite important point to appreciate the relevance of QCD is that whenever we minimize a chi-square, we have a covariance matrix. And in this covariance matrix, we never, for good reasons, put a theoretical uh, component because we don't know what is the statistical meaning or there is no statistical meaning, for instance, in scale variations. But of course, then we have a situation which is quite dramatic because the errors, the experimental errors, <laughs> are at per mil level and the theoretical uncertainties are at percent level. Now, now the point is that the um, k-square fit works well when uh, the, the distance between the data and the templates are of the same order of the experimental errors. But this is not the case because of in the covariance, we would have these very large uncertainties or in the templates, sorry, in the templates we would have these uns terribly large uncertainties. This leads to the following important conclusion that since we are not including a theoretical covariance, a theoretical uh, covariance matrix in the total covariance, then the k-square minimization becomes extremely unstable. If I make a chain a scale variation, the minimum of the k-square can shift by hundreds of MeV. Now, this is quite an embarrassing situation which is essentially forgotten and uh, frozen by re relying on the data-driven approach. Because in this case, we choose one scale, we have one reference, the data, and uh, with respect to that reference, uh, we can, in that specific framework, pursue the template fit approach. Of course, with the data-driven approach, as it is done by the experimental collaborations, we are losing the discussion of theoretical uncertainties. Uh, when I say theoretical uncertainties, I mean perturbative QCD scale variations. The proposal we had uh, a few months ago was to uh, understand better with a new observable this uh, problem. And uh, in order to illustrate it, I would like to show how the lepton PT distribution changes by adding higher and higher orders in, per in QCD. We start from the leading order without a width which has at the end point, which is the quantity that we want to appreciate. We want to appreciate MW over two, which is this position here that you see in this uh, first rough approximation. Then you include the width and you get the blue. Then you include any low fixed order QCD. You have sensitivity to soft radiation. You get a double peak. Only after resummation, you finally get a sensible distribution and the peak, the maximum, of this distribution is roughly two GV away from the endpoint you want to estimate. And two GV is very large compared to eight, to 10 MeV, let's say 2000 compared to eight. Now, the point is that QCD effects are very large and they are intertwined with the MW position. So we should try to disentangle these two kinds of effects. We performed this study. Uh, these are, this is the PT, left PT distribution in different perturbative approximations. You see the improvement going higher and higher with the perturbative order. And here you can find uh, all the details of our simulation. And uh, mm, I'm repeating here, the study of the sensitivity study by comparing the lepton PT distribution computed with two values of MW, which differ by 20 MeV. So the ratio is between, as you see, 399 and 379. Now, the impressive, for me at least, uh, point is that this ratio does not depend on QCD. There's a ratio, these are fluctuations of the Monte Carlo. We're discussing a ratio per mill level, and at all the different orders, the ratio stays the same. So QCD, in this is a pure QCD calculation, essentially factorizes. So the process can be truly described as the production of a W and then its decay. Sensitivity to MW comes from the propagator part and from the decay, from the acceptance, the leptonic acceptance. So uh, th this is quite interesting because the sensitivity is independent of QCD. Of course, the central value that we want to determine and the uncertainty do depend instead on QCD. Now we ask ourselves the question, where is the sensitivity to MW? Where here we could say that it starts roughly at 37 where we start to see a slope. We did a more quantitative study by studying the, taking the distribution, letting MW vary. 
computing a covariance matrix with respect to MW variation. And then we diagonalized this covariance to find the components which are uh, describing the sensitivity, the different sensitivity to MW. And we found that the first component, when, once we diagonalize the covariance, has an eigenvalue which is much larger, more than factor 500, than the second, and then all the others. This eigenvalue, which is uh, associated to this uh, combination, and where most of the sensitivity to NW sits, is uh, associated when we diagonalize the matrix to a quite funny pattern because all the beams of the primary distribution are taken with sine plus up to a certain point and then with sine minus later. So there is a clear, uh, in absolute value, they are quite similar. So we decided to introduce a quantity which mimics this specific combination. So we decided to consider more in detail uh, with an asymmetry built integrating the beams up to this uh, turning point, which we call lower, the, integrating the beams from the turning point up to a certain value maximum, which we call up, and then computing the asymmetry difference divided by sum. This uh, difference is uh, similar, re reflects, uh, is, takes, takes inspiration from the first column of this uh, diagonalization. Now, this is an observable, it's measurable by the accounting, and it's one single number, and it brings, because of the eigenvalue, we saw that the eigenvalue is very large, the, more, the bulk of the sensitivity to MW. When we move MW to the right, for instance, we move events from the blue to the orange region, and therefore the asymmetry will decrease. This is what we see more explicitly here, where we computed the, the asymmetry for different MW values, you see this uh, the, uh, decreasing pattern. You see uh, different perturbative approximations in red, blue, and green. And uh, so the, we, for, for guidance, we imagined to have an experimental value for this quantity, which is the orange band. And we can read MW by the, from the intersection between these uh, theoretical curves and the experimental one. Just to read it, just to say what we want to read, Delta MW theoretical is taken by taking uh, the band, the theoretical band in one approximation and looking for the two intercepts with the central experimental value. For the experimental error, instead, we take one reference theory curve and look for the intersection with the extreme of the experimental band. Of course, we see that the slope expresses the, uh, of the symmetry expresses sensitivity in a given setup. So PT lepton mean, minimum, middle, and max define the setup and this is defines also the determines also the slope. Uh, the slope is the same with every QCD approximation. This is what we just discussed. Okay. And uh, of course the point is that we have a quantity which is uh, has a small statistical errors because we have two large integrated cross sections but also has excellent stability from the QCD point of view because these are total close fiducial rates. So the closest uh, quantity, the close but it is very close to the, the uh, ideal uh, total cross-section. Um, yeah, this is something I already illustrated. And uh, I want to make some comments now. Uh, we studied the um, intercepts between our ideal uh, experimental value and the different theoretical approximations in different setups for different values of PT-lepton minimum, middle, and max. And uh, the good news is that we can, first of all, check if perturbative QCD is converging. And uh, you can read it from the fact that the colored bands at NL, uh, NLL and NLL and NQLL are one inside the, uh, the previous one, like for instance, in this uh, case where the green arrow is pointing. Only if we observe such a pattern of convergence, we can trust the width of the band uh, as an estimator of the perturbative QCD uncertainty. I would not trust uh, the uncertainty band uh, alone in cases where there is no clear pattern of convergence, like in the example just above. Now, you might ask why it is so sensitive when uh, moving from 37 to 38. And the answer is that you are entering re the region of the Jacobian peak where resummation and higher order effects are maximally important. If you stay, on one side of this Jacobian peak, the cross sections to the left 
and the cross of the peak and the cross section which fully includes the peak are separately stable and this explains this convergence this is somehow how we understand it this has been done with a severe cut on the wpt uh, with a more realistic cut of course there are acceptance effects and you see that the bands are larger and uh, but the conclusion is that the perturbative QCD uncertainty is at the level of 10 plus minus 10 MeV is achievable based on charge current data alone. I did not discuss so far the neutral current process. This is quite nice because this is a good starting point for further discussions and the improvement that we, we can imagine uh, goes in different directions. Having um, the, the, I'm trying to compare uh, a template fit approach where perturbative QCD stability is not discussed and is uh, argue, one could argue is not available with respect to a, 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 an observable which clearly converges order by order. Now, taking this starting point, we can discuss the impact of higher order corrections of non perturbative effects. Each of those will yield a vertical offset in the theoretical prediction and correspondingly a shift of MW. Then you can use the same picture, but she moving up and down the theoretical predictions. Non perturbative effects are not anymore central point of the discussion because we don't need it from the very beginning. They are just a refinement on top of NQLL predictions. So this is also something quite important. And in any case, thanks to the fact that everything is linear, the linear dependence on MW allows to an easy estimate of any uncertainty uh, of any source. Um, of course, let's say this is just one number and uh, we need more measurements in order to achieve an accurate description of the data. But the important point is that with this quantity, we managed to uh, study explicitly the quantity which is most sensitive to MW. So the point is now, now we have to fix the accuracy in the data description. I'm done with my first part. And uh, in the remaining 10 minutes, I want to present work which uh, has been done in the LHC Tevatron MW combination working group, which you can find with this reference on the archive. Uh, there has been a discussion also about the wording of the slides. So I'm referring to the slides by William Barter, for, uh, which have been extensively discussed, discussed in the working group. Um, in this uh, working group, all these measurements from LEP, CDF, D0, Atlas, and LHCB have been considered. Here you find all the references. And uh, mm, the problem that has been addressed is the following. Once you have uh, available the numbers by these different collaborations, you would like to make a combination. Now, you cannot trivially take the numbers and sum them in some average because uh, they are not the same quantities. Each of these numbers has been extracted with a different PDF set, with a different QCD event generator, so that these numbers refer to different theoretical models. Before making any combination, you would like to remove these elements of difference, aligning or putting on the same footing all the results. Of course, the point is that these measurements span two decades. There has been, in the meanwhile, remarkable theoretical progress. And uh, so one has to account for all these, uh, the effects that have been available with the time and uh, from the point of view of generators and PDFs. The idea is that the combination study seeks to make an update or an alignment, if you prefer, of the different results to a common QCD framework. Common QCD framework means, at least for the PDFs and for the QCD description of the production of the W. The idea is that the updated value will be taken starting from the published value by each collaboration, estimating the impact of the usage of a different PDF set. So there is update to a common PDF set. If there are problems in the description of QCD corrections, these are with Resbos 1, this is the case, there is a, a, an update to a common um, QCD model. And uh, if there are additional differences, they are, have also been taken into account in order to have at the end a set of numbers which is ex referring to the same theoretical model. For the LHCB, this analysis has been very easy because they have their analysis up and running so they can repeat it at any time. Uh, in, uh, for all the other experiments, it has been necessary to generate samples with a dedicated <laughs> detector simulation in order to have the two alternatives, the original one and the updated one, to be compared and in order to appreciate all the shifts. 
um, the fitting procedure has been done exactly uh, using uh, the same model with reference and updated distributions for PDFs, MINLO for WJ production has been used. And uh, the two main references for the QCD study has been, have been uh, RESBOS and DY Turbo. The detector emulation simplified yields effects at the MEV level. So one should not worry if the reanalysis has not been done with the full detector simulation. This has been validated. And so uh, this is a source of a very negligible bias. There is a point which I always um, want to stress because uh, it's not completely obvious, is that after all the updates, the distributions are reweighted to reproduce the experimental PTZ distribution. So whatever model, RESBOS or DY Turbo, in any case, uh, our experimental colleagues trust their measurement of PTZ more than uh, any uh, event generator, so that the corrections that we applied are in any case then brought back to this experimental uh, benchmark and then uh, the combination is possible. When available, also PTW data have been used. Now, for the effect of impact of PDFs, here you see in the squares, uh, the number, the zero shift, because this is the PDF set used uh, by that experiment. This zero used the CTEX 6.6, CDF used the CTEX 6, and Atlas used CT10. So you, there is no shift. If they had used a different PDF sets, they would have found for the central values, uh, value, uh, MW values shifted by the amount that you find here. This is for the lepton PT distribution. Now you see that we are discussing shifted range in the plus minus 20 MeV. So numbers which are quite large in this discussion. And it's interesting to see that in the combination in 2013, by the, the Tevatron combination of CDF and D0 results, they ignored the fact that CTEX 6 and CTEX 6.6 differ by 17 MeV. Just to mention that these numbers are there and have to be taken into account. And I want to make a further comment later about how CDF published with an MPDF 3.1. Mm, of course, once you try to describe Drelian and make a compatibility assessment, uh, uh, you have to see whether your description of the full data set is uh, in good shape. And actually, this is a quite interesting point because PDFs, uh, there are PDFs that were good to describe Tevatron data. There are PDF sets more modern, which describe nicely LHC data. But what about the full data set simultaneously? And uh, essentially, the answer is that uh, there is no PDF set providing a good description. You can see here the chi-square per degree of freedom and the probability of these chi-squares. So the uh, set which best describes the data, but best means 1.5% of probability, is uh, CT18, because by, by construction, deliberately, they have larger uncertainties so that it's easier for them to accommodate all the data. But this is quite an important message because, in general, there is tension from this uh, side. Concerning uh, the QCD modeling, uh, in practice, the main point is that the RESBOS C and RESBOS CP versions used by CDF and D0 had problems in the resubmission part. So somehow I would call it a mistake. This mistake has been corrected in uh, what is called the RESBOS 2. And so the, going from these two old RESBOS versions to modern generators that are here or aligned has an impact at the level of minus 10, minus 8 MeV. Now, all these effects uh, have been somehow taken into account uh, in uh, when uh, uh, CDF reported uh, the shift from CTEX 6M to an MPDF 3.1, they um, put together in this uh, shift uh, two effects which have completely different origin, the plus 14 MeV growing from one PDF set to the other, and the minus 10 MeV of going from one generator to the other. So altogether, <laughs> these two effects amount to this plus 3.9 that they quote, but uh, the origin is, uh, as you can see, not trivial. In any case, once all the uh, elements have been, all the results have been updated and aligned, uh, these results have been combined using a best linear unbiased estimator after reproducing all the internal results of the collaborations. For the PDFs, it's interesting to see that there are correlations between different experiments uh, due to PDFs. And correlations can be positive, but can also be negative. This is what we pointed out in 2015 by noticing that LACB results are anti-correlated with respect to Atlas and CMS results because of rapidity dependence. Uh, 
So, but the also interesting point is, is that the different PDF sets have a different amount of anti-correlation. So uh, it's not always a negative anti-correlation, as you can see. For instance, an NPDF 4.0 tends to estimate this anti-correlation uh, in a weaker, by a, a weaker amount. And finally, I can come to the uh, results after all the updates have been applied. So these are the improved results, corrected. And we can see, we, uh, I mentioned CT18, but uh, the same analysis has been repeated for all these PDF sets, just to be uh, democratic, let's say. And uh, once you combine all these results, uh, there are four degrees of freedom that you're combining. Uh, you obtain this central value. The combined PDF uncertainty is estimated to be of these sides, but the k-square of this combination and the probability of this k-square is absolutely low, very, very low. So in practice, mm, the full combination is disfavored and there is no PDF set which is able to account or to accommodate uh, this data simultaneously. Then you can say, okay, let's look more in detail at the different results. Here you can group the results, Tevatron results, so CDF and D0 are here, LHC and then all. So all is what I presented in the previous table, but probably more interesting is to see what happens when you exclude CDF, that you get a central value, which is much lower than all the others. So essentially Atlas, LHCB, LEP are in agreement with a lower value, where you do not exclude CDF, uh, CDF is very precise and pulls the central value to a larger value. Now, this is okay description, but if you try to compute the k-square of these different combinations, you can see that excluding CDF gives you a 91% of probability for the combination, which means that the mean value is a good description of the different individual results. Whereas if you take uh, the central value when you include CDF, now the k-square that you compute is very poor because the central value stays in the middle of nothing and uh, uh, all the data are either to the left or to the right very far and the k-square probability is very low. In the best case with CT18, we have a 0 0.5 percent of uh, of uh, probability for this case square and uh, okay uh, having these results available we can also measure in terms of sigma what is uh, the com the result removing cdf compared to cdf itself which is uh, 3.6 sigma zero i have my conclusions and the conclusions are that the full combination is disfavored because of this low case square probability Excluding CDF, we have a much nicer description, which is also a quantitative and neutral way to looking at this data. And from the point of view of the first part of the talk, I would say that we are neglecting one important source, source of uncertainty, which is not included in this experimental discussion. And uh, this important source, source of uncertainty is the estimate of the impact of scale variations, which I show is at least at the level of 10 MeV, if not more. So I would say that um, since we are here in a theory meeting, uh, my last line is what I would like to stress, namely that having observables which are computable, so not a template fit approach, but really computing a quantity, uh, allows us to exploit the impressive progress of perturbative QCD calculations, putting on more solid grounds all these discussions. The template fit seems to me inadequate to reach this level of precision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. We have uh, plenty of time for discussion and I see that Massimiliano is already ready for it. So uh, since uh, we are recording, uh, I have to, <laughs> have to calm down. <laughs> so no, I mean, I have a comment on this second uh, part. So, um, I mean, I understand the, the motivation, okay, of this is clear, but I find this extremely dangerous, okay? So for the following reason. So if we take, uh, so if uh, we tell our experimental colleagues that, okay, they can do their analysis with whatever tool they like, because in the end there will be someone who does this work after them, uh, it, it will be even go worse than, than what we have seen with CDF. Okay, so I think that a measurement should 
a measurement of NW, but a measurement of whatever, mm -hmm. should be done with the best tools that are around, trying to assess as much as we can the systematic uncertainties, the theory uncertainties in a conservative way. And the measurements to, should stand forever in principle. So, I mean, we cannot go back 20 years after a measurement has been done to look, yes, okay, but they, they use this tool. Now we have this better. So let's to try to dig out. So are we sure that we are able to do it properly? Maybe, maybe yes, but I'm wondering if uh, doing this, uh, you know, uh, archaeology, okay, in, uh, in measurements that have been done uh, 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 many years ago, it, it can be done properly. It can, it can be really done, but you can really pin, pin down everything, changing the PDF, changing the Monte Carlo. So again, I mean, we should the message that we should give, now here we are all theorists, the message that we should give to our colleagues is that they have to do their best. And they have to, to and and there shouldn't be a race uh, to come up uh, with the best, uh, you know, with zero error. Because nowadays, I always say that we, we have to give uh, results with zero error. If uh, I, I do a calculation and I have a, a larger error than your, then we are in trouble. If I do a measurement uh, as an experiment and I come up with an error which is larger than uh, than the other previous experiments, then we are in trouble. With this uh, attitude, we go nowhere. Mm -hmm. And we do, we damage our field. So again, I, I appreciate this this uh, this uh, this, uh, this this study, but uh, I, I I mean I find it a bit dangerous. Sorry for. Do you want to reply? <laughs> no, no, I, I I tend to fully agree. Uh, the questions you're uh, raising are about data preservation, but not only, but also about the analysis code preservation, namely the fact that codes used to make the analysis are not available, makes this archaeology a reverse engineering process, which is almost impossible, as you say. So it's really difficult. Uh, I appreciate the fact that LHCB was able to rerun on the spot their analysis, because their analysis is very recent, of course. Now, the point is how to preserve uh, all this information, because information is, so interpreting the data, MW is the interpretation of the data. So we need to keep not only the data, but also the tools to interpret. That, that's somehow the point. Concerning the um, theoretical uncertainties and the fact that we have to be conservative, uh, the discussion in this working group has been very, very long and difficult, I can say so. Just to, and uh, what, what is uh, somehow difficult to transmit is the need for of benchmarking, because in this work, which is, you, you read it, and uh, almost all the codes that have been used, uh, part of them have been benchmarked, and we know we can trust their predictions, but there are also codes which are not benchmarked. Okay, maybe they're right. I don't know, personally, if they are or they are not. Uh, okay. Uh, the answer is that PTZ protects us from everything, which is a little bit too much. I mean, I'm, because uh, assuming that nature is the true QCD is a good uh, starting point for a discussion, but there can be biases that we would like in any case to uh, to check uh, or to, to check the, the absence of possible biases. So I have a question uh, myself. If you go on slide 22 about the combination, um, yeah, exactly. When you say that uh, the thing has been updated by changing what is the shift with respect to the choices that were made, but uh, I mean, what I didn't understand is that there, there is an error associated with the prediction with the new set. So how is this error? I mean, you're only adding the shift, but not the error associated with No, 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 because there, there have been, uh, everything has been refitted every time. So that, so that you can compute the shift of the central value. Okay. But then since they have been simulated, uh, samples of events. Ah, so basically, you are redoing the analysis with the new PDF in, in, in a okay. in a simplified way in okay. order to account at least for the fact that you have to reestimate and certain. Because my worry was that if you do the procedure of starting from the old prediction with the old error and then you just add the shift or with the error, then you are going to inflate. No, you you you. But and okay, you can also see how then reevaluating re for each PDF sets, you you find all these different numbers which are essentially, let's say, uh, naively I would have expected 
that uh, I, I don't know that this zero and CDF would have the, the same. Uh, so these errors reflect the peculiarity of each individual experiment in a, and uh, they have been re-estimated okay. with this uh, uh, extensive simulation of uh, of the okay. an update of defense. So new samples have been generated. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I think uh, you were first. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I have a question. At some point on your slides, there was the statement, if we exclude the CDF value, everything is good. Yeah, or oh, one one further. It doesn't matter. I mean, there was a statement if we exclude it, the chi squared is fine and we are happy. And if we include it, it's not so good, but this cannot be the philosophy, no? I mean, there is a experimental the, value which has been measured by someone. So Yeah, but this is a statistical statement that that uh, yeah. mean that mean value is in the middle of nowhere and uh, does not describe the data because if you take this mean value with a, such a small error, you don't reach any of the four data points. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, what it means that you have a low uh, chi-square probability because uh, you have to stretch your, uh, you have to take many sigmas to reach the data, or you should inflate with some tolerance your sigma because you are suspecting that some uh, error has not been properly accounted, and this error should be common to all the experiments, for instance, QCD uncertainties. Yeah, okay, but what does the official, let's say, philosophy now of the LHC? No, there's I mean, no... The sub, sub working group. I mean, you cannot just say, in principle, let's exclude this thing uh, also in the PDG results and so on. There has no, to be some kind of way to... There is no, that there is no philosophy. These are uh, raw numbers. Yeah. This, this is uh, non-trivial because of the previous part, PDFs and QCD, mm. but this is a, an honest exercise of reevaluating all, all these uncertainties, making a combination all together or uh, excluding one experiment at a time and giving the case square probabilities. Mm. That's it. So I don't see why you are concerned no, I'm, about. I'm, no, I'm wondering what the, what the next step will be. What will be the number, for example, in the PDG for the W well, mass? The PDG has the attitude of putting everything together, giving you a number which has unfortunately 0.5% of case square probability. If you are happy with that, you mm -hmm. choose that. That's, mm -hmm. uh, so we have provided both alternatives because it's really, I would never recommend such a combination which expresses mm -hmm. attention rather than mm -hmm. uh, expressing mm -hmm. some physics mm -hmm. and at the same time uh, removing one by one you can also point out yeah. where the tension is stemming from so that's okay. uh, also quite useful information and you see that there is no it's not a pdf problem okay so, so the all the is information just, is, uh, yeah, is there it's just numbers and you say this is what it is and you have to do with it what you i mean if someone now comes and says i want the w mass for example as a precision test right, which many people are doing, uh, then it would be up to them to choose which of the numbers. Let's say uh, this is a situation with tension and yeah. uh, I'm, we, are not, we cannot really solve it by simply saying that the PDG recipe solves the problem. The, the mm -hmm. tension remains and we are trying to express it okay. rather than mm -hmm. this is the only thing that scientifically we can do. I mean, Okay, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, questions. So first is, uh, so you introduced this uh, PT asymmetry. As I understood, the idea is uh, just to go from a distribution to a single value, right? Uh, I think it was page 14. Yeah, because it simplifies the discussion uh, yeah. of QCD uncertainty. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, uh, perhaps one can get uh, more information from the distribution if you don't uh, just take the difference, but if you take something like a weighted difference, because I mean, uh, just consider uh, small regions around these turnover points. Uh, uh, and then by subtracting these regions, uh, you almost don't have any asymmetry there, but you introduce some statistical fluctuations. Uh, I, I guess that uh, yeah. whenever you give a fully differential distribution, beam by beam, you have this problem. So you, we have it in uh, one yes, point. Yes, actually, it's and true it's about one limiting almost, factor. So I guess it's, it, it's true about almost any asymmetry which. Uh, people use, uh, so they just consider simple difference, but one often can get more bar by doing some way. Let's say the, the idea, the, the rationale behind this proposal is that uh, if you don't, we could make a weighted uh, combination mm -hmm. by taking the values, the explicit values of each in each bin. Uh, yeah. We could be yeah. ex uh, maximally efficient, yeah. 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 but this is from the experimental point of view, a nightmare. If you make this a... Uh, 
I, I mean, why anyway to compute this asymmetry, you need this uh, PT information. So in each event, you know this PT and- But you it, would agree it, that- It's uh, a bit more difficult, but it's- uh, but You would agree that from the theoretical point of view, a fiducial rate in a certain interval is the simplest quantity we can uh, discuss. Um, maybe even if it's not maximally efficient, mm -hmm. its simplicity probably pays off. Okay. I, I would say that this was our point. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, each choice of the weights mm -hmm. becomes a new observable. And uh, yes, yes. Um, optimizing this is, uh, I, I would be happy to discuss okay, it, it is, it, uh, it, as Okay, thanks. Just another uh, small uh, question. Uh, on page uh, 25, uh, you mentioned uh, this. Uh, PDF, different PDF sets, and you mentioned that CT18, uh, yes, uh, have uh, be, uh, best uh, chi squared uh, because of larger uncertainties. So, what do you actually mean? Do you mean uh, that you uh, use this confidence level 90%? You don't rescale to 68%? No, 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 no. Uh, all uh, the, the numbers here have been rescaled down to 68%. CT uh -huh. uses a different in their working uh, assumptions. They mm -hmm. work with 90% uh, of confidence level, mm -hmm. but uh, then everything has been rescheduled okay, to 68. Okay. So the comparison is fair. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, their treatment of uncertainties leads to slightly mm -hmm. larger errors. So that's uh, their uh, approach. Mm -hmm. So I cannot really comment more on uh, mm -hmm. how. The, mm -hmm. So an MPDF 4.0, for instance, is one mm -hmm. of the most aggressive from yeah, the point I of see. view. And, uh, but these are specific choice of each. At, 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 and, and then this, this difference, which you see for, for various PDF sets, so it must be traced back to a difference in any particular uh, part and distribution, right? Like it, it must be something very different for valence or seek works or whatever. Well, well let's say know? yes, yes, of course. And uh, uh, you can read from the different, in the different rows, uh, which data set has been used. Mm. And you know, from the theoretical point of view, mm. each of them, which is the sensitivity to, so to which part on combination they are sensitive. So from, from there, you can read where uh, the problem is stemming from. Is it, is it possible to fit all these data sets uh, in, in the future PDF feed, do you think? In a single future PDF feed, such that it will result. Well, I mean, I, you, you I, don't refit PDFs, right, with the studies, but one can always. Well, actually, they they are essentially. Uh, no, uh, well, um, each PDF, each global set uh, removes some of them for yes. for for specific reasons, but uh, include almost all of them, uh, with some okay. Ex exceptions. Okay, thank you very much. Just a curiosity. And uh, uh, what is the level of agreement between different PDF sets uh, if you exclude uh, CDF? Because if I understand correctly, uh, include mm -hmm. all PDF, right? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know by heart. And uh, I, I, I guess that with, with the framework, it's possible to answer your question. But uh, I don't remember that uh, an analysis excluding one by one these uh, data points uh, has been performed. So this could also be, but of course you can start from their chi square per degree of freedom just to see, uh, I would start from the largest in order to exclude that, uh, that data set. But, uh, but okay, let's say here it expresses that there is a little bit of tension again. Okay. I have a practical question, I think. Um, that is, I mean, if I take the results you presented uh, face value, Right, it seems that there is a discrepancy between uh, CDF and the rest of the world, right? And I don't see CDF redoing their analysis because they can't take data anymore. And uh, mm -hmm. if they don't have the code anymore to run, this is the result we have. And it seems unlikely that every other experiment now changes the value to match CDFs. So are we gonna just live with uh, this discrepancy or at some point people will forget about it and say, the, the new result is the one of the ever, everyone else but CDF. I mean, what is the attitude, right? Well, the, the attitude is, of course, uh, re having more measurements would be interesting. And CMS is the, the first candidate, of course. Uh, the second point, I guess, is that uh, I, what I can say personally, but I, I don't know, I, I would like to discuss it here, is that, um, that the absence of... Uh, uh, so the, the discussion about its perturbative QCD uncertainties could be a quite relevant point because if you're adding plus minus 10, 15 MeV, most of this tension 
boils down. So uh, now this is somehow also what uh, the, the, what Massimiliano was saying before. Are we conservative here? I would say no, and uh, I would like to discuss. I mean, I don't have a great answer. If please. Okay. Okay. Just to brief. Yeah, I know it's a comment to the last question. In fact. Um, What's his name? I don't know. Daniel, I have a comment to your question. So there was this WMAS workshop in at CERN in March or April, April, I think. And my understanding was this is an unofficial statement now, of course, but afterwards talking to the two people who did the CDF analysis, uh, what they said is that they are interested in redoing it. However, they cannot do it like, you know, they do it some conference, someone has another idea, they do it again and so on. So my understanding was that they're now kind of waiting for some agreed upon procedures, tools, and so on and so forth. And then the probability is non-zero. But I mean, I'm not one of them. I just, this is what my understanding was, right? Well, the question whether they can, I think the, it's more a time question, yeah? In a sense, a human human power question. It's about time. If you want to do it with them. No, I think they can do it if they want. It's it's a person power discussion. But my understanding was that they're not blocking. I mean, they're not saying that's it, we move on, but they're quite interested. But it's just because only two people at the moment, so it's not so easy. Yeah. Okay, we can discuss it. Uh... I, I, I'm more pessimistic, Tanya, than... I think we'll have plenty of time we'll... over lunch and of the rest of the exactly. workshop to carry on this discussion. Let's thank Alessandro again.